Hi everyone, welcome to my session, Back to the Future, all tricks invading a new attack surface. In this talk, I will show our classic attack technique that we are all known and all thoughts belong to the past, become relevant again in the no-code, low-code platforms. My name is Uriel Kayam, I'm a senior security researcher at no-code security and uh, my research is mainly focused on finding new vulnerabilities and mitigation in no-code and low-code platforms. I'll start the session with a brief introduction into the uh, no-code platforms, uh, focusing on the challenges, and especially the security challenges uh, of using those platforms. Then I'll demonstrate a few attack demos uh, across different platforms, all classic attack that you all know, but probably didn't think that are relevant for no-code platforms. And I'll close the session with the mediation tips and best practices. So, as you might know, local and no-code platforms are getting uh, a lot of traction from enterprises, um, and we're seeing fast adoption of this technology, especially among uh, larger companies. These platforms, such as UiPath, uh, Power Platform by uh, Microsoft, uh, Mendix, OutSystem, ServiceNow, and others, help organizations to um, accelerate the digital transformations. But these are not tools that simply accelerate the process of, uh, of creating software. They change who creates software and how software is created. Those platforms allow business users and business units across the organization to transform manual processes into digital ones. They created new and exciting digital opportunities. And you can see it in practice. As uh, Gardner said, that by 2025, 70% of new applications will be developed using no-code, low-code platforms. So before, uh, before we dive in into the platform challenges, uh, let's look at an example from one of our, one of our uh, deployments. Um, we talked to the security team, and these are the numbers of components they thought they had in the no-code platform. In practice, as you can see, the major differences. The first challenges for the security team is to understand the size of their environment and how significant and urgent the issue of securing the no-code platforms. So while no-code platforms generate many new opportunities, they also create new challenges and represent what we call shadow engineering. We call it shadow engineering because the security teams has lack of visibility into those platforms. Now, let's talk about scale and skill. So we are seeing far more applications developed by far more people than we used to, and most of them are not skilled software engineers, and they are not technical employees at all. Additionally, these citizen developers are spread across different departments with different culture and different mindset. It can be the HR department, their marketing, finance, etc. Regarding speed, if one of you ever used these no-code, low-code platforms, you know that you can create an application within a few hours from the very first idea until it is live on production. So what about the security tools we have? The traditional tools will not work here because there is no standard code to scan. So we're left with the manual monitoring and reviews, but because of the scale and the speed, you cannot review so many apps manually. And there are organization limitations as well. Let's take peer code for example. Peer code review requires peers who can do that and are tasked to doing it. From the attacker perspective, they already have the knowledge and the tools to explore this application. Take SQL injection for example which I'll demonstrate in a few moments. These apps are connected to an SQL database and use SQL queries. Obviously, 
attacker have no problem to exploit this vulnerability. So let's round up. The attacker know how to do it. The experienced developers knows how to mitigate them. But what about citizen developer? Our first example will focus on RPA, which is Robotic Process Automation. Um, many business users create automation that help them uh, with their manual tasks. But what are the risks? Especially when it comes to an RPA, uh, you might think that these automations are internal. But an automation that reads email from a private mailbox, or analyzing submissions of public form, both create an external attack surface. Let's see what can go wrong. In our first example, we use the Microsoft Automation tool, Power Automate. Um, this, automa this automation uh, deals with user submissions on complaint form, uh, which is made using Microsoft Forms and is open to uh, public use. Uh, in this flow, it is triggered by the submission. We use an SQL database to save the complaint and to get the complainer previous complaints. And we send emails both to the complainer and to the form owner. As you can see, when a user submits a form, he receives a thank you email um, with list of his previous complaints. And the form owner gets the complaints directly to the uh, to his mailbox. Um, this is a legitimate flow. Citizen developer will absolutely make. But what can an attacker do with it? In this demo, you can see how an attacker is using yeah, sorry, it's using this public form to create an SQL injection and an HTML injection. It uses the name field for the SQL injection and the complaint message for the HTML injection. Here you can see the email that sent back to the attacker. And here you can see the email that the form owner will get. So let's dive deeper into the automation steps that made this automation vulnerable. The citizen developer used the complainer's name in the SQL query to retrieve the relevant previous complaints. Again, it is obvious for us that it is wrong, but plat the platform enables it and the business user are doing it. The attacker uses the name field to inject an SQL query in this case, let's see if my pointer will work. Yeah. So here, in this case, he asks for uh, uh, the domain names and the salaries from an employee's table. In other direction, the citizen developer used the complaint message for the email body. And again, the platform by default uses the variable uh, in the email body as is. That means that if the message contains an HTML code, it will be compiled uh, in the user's mailbox. And the attacker can create a phishing page, phishing page or using a link to a malicious site as we did here. What, make it, what makes it work was, is that this email comes from an internal email address. So it doesn't look suspicious and it passes all the mailbox security filters and warnings. Now, let's look at another example from a different platform. In this demo, you, we use UiPath, which is a great tool that enables users to create automations that can run um, both in the cloud or on-prem. Uh, it uses actions that connect to external services, such as mailbox on one end, and on the other end, it can run local commands, such as writing to a local directory. In this automation, we built a flow that connected to our mailbox and saves all the attachment into a zip file. We run this demo on our local host, it connected to the UI path, uh, reads our emails, and suddenly the calculator is running. Let's see what happened here. We use the start process section 
um, it's execute local processes and in this case we use it to run the CMD and with the tar command over here we use the tar command um, we created a zip file from all the files we downloaded from a single email in this email among the legitimate files you can see it here um, we added one file with the CMD commands in the file name this email doesn't need to be opened to make the attack work. This flow is triggered by any new email that is received. And the calculator was obviously an example, but imagine what can we execute using the file name only. Another type of attack I want to talk about is supply chain attack, which is, by the way, uh, part of our top 10 in no-code, low-code security. All the different platforms have their own marketplace, and they encourage users to use these ready-to-use components. Um, this component created either by the platform users or by the platform provider. And as we often like to say, a chain is strong as its weakest link. So the person responsible for the third-party component and decide which dependencies to add to the environment is the citizen developer. As we already mentioned, the citizen developer is lack of security knowledge and do not fully understand the security impact of using these components. What I want to show you in the demo is how easy it is to add a malicious component even if you have a technical or security background. Once we acknowledge that there are malicious components in the wild that citizen developer might use, we must ask ourselves, how long does it take for the security team to realize that their apps is using a vulnerable or unpatched third-party components? For our first supply chain attack, a pre-usage infection, we will use again in the UiPath platform. UiPath has a few third-party component feeds, including their marketplace, uh, the UiPath official feed, and others. Um, using UiPath Studio, which runs on the, on the citizen developer host, um, the developer can easily add components or script to his project, and those will be downloaded from one of the feeds and run on the local machine. In our demo, in our demo we can see a developer adding a dependency named multiplication, which one is a multiplication action. Um, and at the moment, he adds the package. It is it downloads from the feeds into his local host. And uh, without any warning or any uh, additional confirmation, the malicious code is running immediately. And in this case, open a, a Windows message, a warning, warning message. Notice that this behavior is different from classic supply chain attack. When a traditional software developer adds a malicious component to his environment, the malicious code will only execute at one time. This is not the case here. This behavior is the same in most no-code, low-code platforms. When you add a third-party component into your environment, things will start to happen. So that was obviously a bad choice by the citizen developer, and one may ask, how did I put my malicious package there in the first place? I'll explain in a couple of minutes. Now, let's explore some more developer choice that can lead him into a dependency confusion attack. UiPath platform uses Nugget framework um, for the package manager. And when using Nugget feed, I declare in my project which package I want to use. That is, in essence, the dependency name and the version. The job of the package manager is to ensure that I will get the dependency I asked. It is done by looking into multiple feeds that potentially contain the package, regardless of where I, as a developer, find the package during the development phase. Now, some of these sources are public repositories where an attacker can upload the malicious content. In our example, the UiPath include nugget.org repository, 
by default in its search for dependencies. Users may choose to exclude an agg.org, which is a public repository, as a possible dependency feed. But again, they are citizen developer, and you need to be security oriented to do so. The dependencies feed was one choice. The other choice developer needs to take regarding the dependency version. He could use a restricted version and will get the package only if the specific version um, is, one of, is in one of the repositories. But another option for the developer is to use loose version requir requirements. Loose means that I want at least this version, but if this version does not exist in any feed, because it includes some bugs or vulnerabilities or any other reason, I want the next available version. Again, this is the developer choice, and by the way, it is also the default behavior for dependencies of dependencies. With these two choices, let's see the following scenario. The environment uses a public feed, such as nagit.org. The developer asked for package using loose version requirement, and the specific version does not exist in any of the feeds. As an attacker, I have the knowledge about all the feeds. I can track package updates and in the official play, in the official on the marketplace, and then insert my package with a specially crafted version, version number. So let's go to, through this example in more details. A developer uh, wants to use the multiplication with loose version 1.1.0. The package manager search in all the repositories that are configured by default in the UIP Studio. Uh, it's searching the orchestrator library where the package is not found, in the UiPath official feed where it's found with version 1.2.5, in the marketplace where it's found with the version 1.0.1 .1, which is too low, and then in the Nagato where we injected our package with version 1.1.5. So the attacker uses the Nagato repository to inject the malicious package in this gap. By the way, I told you before that dependencies always use loose versioning for their dependencies. So we did a quick, a quick research into dependencies from UiPath uh, in the official feeds. And we ask all the dependencies with version that does not exist anymore. We found that there are 20 vulnerable dependencies out there and four of them are ready to be exploited. So if you don't want to wait for someone else to upload a vulnerable package to the official feed, let me tell you how we did it on our own. We created a package called Fibonacci. Uh, we upload a package uh, that is actually calculated the nth Fibonacci number to the UiPath marketplace. We use a loose version and ask for version 1.0 of a uh, multiplication package. We upload a benign multiplication package to the nage.org feed with version 2.0. We pass the review process of the UiPath official marketplace, and then we upload a new and malicious package with version 1.5 to the nage.org. So everyone using this package is infected, and we didn't do any change in our package in the UiPath marketplace. So we saw that UiPath Marketplace has a few flaws, but it is not only in UiPath. All platforms I mentioned, uh, I mentioned here have their own marketplace, and in all of them, getting infected by a malicious component is due to the developer choice. In contrast to what we just saw, where the vulnerability is mostly due to the developer uh, decision, now I will show our vulnerability that in some sense is part of the platform design. Meetout system, another leader in the category of low-code, no-code development platform. This platform also is marketplace called Forge. And what we were able to do in this platform is to create new organization users 
that have access to restricted applications like a regular organization uses. Let's see the trick. So the first bad choice is to take our malicious package from the forge. Users choose to use this package that looks like you connect it uh, to Slack. This package has a flow that runs in the init phase before it is even used, immediately when you add this package to your environment. What the package does is to add registered user to the environment. It adds it to the users list, and it adds it a username and password that we choose, and it's hard-coded uh, to the package. And the last choice the developer makes is, again, part of the platform design is allowing only, uh, you can say it, is allowing only registered user to access uh, sensitive screens in the applications. And those registered users come from the user list we just edited. So there are no additional security rules or any other restrictions. Any developer who uses our model gives us immediate access to all the restricted application. What we just saw sounds bad to add users uh, you wish into uh, other environment, but let's see in this demo um, how we created another package that added user to the admin list. Um, as you just saw, we are uh, trying to log in with this credential, it fails. Um, afterwards, we uh, published the, our package and our fake, uh, our fake user now we're trying to log in again. And he has um, access into the victim out system service center. But how will we make out system trust our package? We don't need to. This is by design, and out system itself publishes a template app that adds user to the organization trusted list. So every, organi every organization that uses this template has some users shouldn't be there. So let's back to the basics. What can we do to mitigate these issues? When using a package manager, we need to use only trusted sources and to make sure we are downloading the version we wish. Regarding the component usage, we need to make some standards in which component we are okay with using in an organization or to apply some threat intelligence to make sure our third-party components do not contain any vulnerabilities. To avoid injection attack in automations, uh, we need to make a tool that makes sure we use action safely we use a prepared statement, for example, in SQL, or we're using encode URI component when we're using a variable in the in emails. So the security teams has new challenges. There are different employees type and different department that develops application instead of a central engineering department. Local no code applications are adopted faster and in larger number. It can be 10 times more than traditional code software. Uh, if security teams thought the shift left is difficult for security, for uh, software engineering, think about all the citizen developers. So we saw that the threats are out there and the attackers are ready to exploit them. And we will not educate business user to be a skilled developer. On the other end, we cannot do it manually. So the only possible solution for organizations will be to find an automated solution for this issue. Thank you everyone for listening. Um, thank you.